Hello everyone, my name's Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. In today's video, we're going to discuss phase diagrams and heating curves. Let's start with phase diagrams. A phase diagram is essentially an equilibrium map. The horizontal axis represents temperature and the vertical axis represents pressure. Every point on this diagram corresponds to a specific set of conditions and the location of that point tells us which phase of matter, solid, liquid, or gas, is thermodynamically the most stable. In this section, we're going to focus on the phase diagram of water. Here you see the labeled regions that represent the single phase domains. The curved lines separating these regions are known as phase boundaries. Any point along a boundary represents a set of conditions where two phases coexist in equilibrium. Crossing one of these boundaries corresponds to a phase transition because the system is moving from one stable phase to another. Along the solid liquid boundary, which you see here, the processes of melting, aka fusion, and freezing occur. On this line, solid and liquid phases coexist in equilibrium. For water, at one atmosphere of pressure, this corresponds to the normal freezing point of zero degrees Celsius. Along the liquid vapor boundary or the liquid gas boundary, the processes of vaporization and condensation occur. On this line, liquid and gas coexist in equilibrium. For water, at one atmosphere of pressure, this corresponds to the normal boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. At pressures above one atmosphere, the boiling temperature increases, whereas at lower pressures, it decreases. Finally, we have our solid gas boundary. Here, the processes of sublimation and deposition occur. On this line, solid and vapor coexist in equilibrium. Below the triple point pressure, which is approximately 0.006 atmosphere for water, you'll notice that the liquid phase is no longer stable. So under such low pressure conditions, heating a solid bypasses the liquid phase entirely and it produces a direct transition from solid to gas via sublimation. Going in the opposite direction from gas to solid, that is known as deposition. Now let's consider two particularly important points on the phase diagram. The first is the triple point. This is the unique combination of temperature and pressure where all three phases, solid, liquid, and gas, coexist in equilibrium. This also explains why below the triple point pressure, the liquid phase is not accessible. Substances that possess multiple crystalline solid forms, they can actually exhibit more than one triple point, and that's just going to correspond to different solid-solid fluid equilibrii, which appears as multiple intersection points on their phase diagrams. The second important point is the critical point. The critical point marks the end of the liquid gas boundary. So beyond this temperature and pressure, the distinction between liquid and vapor disappears and the system becomes a supercritical fluid. This is a phase with liquid-like density, but gas-like diffusion and flow. Now, water's phase diagram, it contains a highly unusual feature. The solid liquid boundary, it slopes negatively. To see why this matters, remember that the slope of this line depends on how the volume changes when a substance melts. For most substances, the solid is denser than the liquid, so melting increases the volume. Pressure favors the phase that takes up less space, so higher pressure stabilizes the solid. That is why the solid-liquid line slopes upward or positively for most materials. But water behaves differently. Ice has an open hydrogen-bonded network that makes it less dense than liquid water. When ice melts, the open structure collapses and the molecules pack more closely. So the liquid takes up less volume. Here, the liquid is denser than the solid and pressure favors the liquid instead of the solid. That is why the solid-liquid line slopes negatively. 
Now at one atmosphere of pressure, I'm gonna repeat that the freezing point of water is zero degrees Celsius. If the pressure is increased, the freezing temperature decreases, meaning ice melts more readily under pressure. If the pressure decreases but stays above that triple point, the freezing temperature increases, and that expands the stability range of ice. The, the key takeaway is that water is the exception. Higher pressure stabilizes the liquid phase, whereas, whereas in most substances, higher pressure favors the solid. And keep in mind that a positive solid liquid boundary line means that the solid is more dense than the liquid and a negatively sloped solid liquid boundary line tells you that the liquid is more dense than the solid. Finally, let's discuss how to interpret and apply a phase diagram. So given a specific temperature and pressure, you can go ahead and locate that point on the diagram to determine the stable phase. If the point lies in one of the single phase regions, then only that phase is stable. If it falls on a boundary, two phases coexist in equilibrium, and if it happens to fall exactly at the triple point, then all three phases coexist simultaneously. Let's take all of this information and apply it to some practice problems. This first one says, which of the following is false about phase diagrams? Let's work through each option. A says the x-axis is in units of temperature and the y-axis is in units of pressure. That's true. That is how phase diagrams are set up, especially what we're going to be seeing very commonly in our general chemistry course. A is true. B says a phase diagram can only have one triple point. That's actually the false statement. Some substances can have multiple triple points because they have more than one stable solid form. In fact, B is the correct answer, but we're still going to work through C and D. C says, the triple point is where three phases are in equilibrium. That's correct, that's the definition of the triple point. And D says a solid liquid line with a positive slope indicates that the solid is more dense than the liquid. This is also true. Remember, for most substances, the line is positive because solids pack more tightly than liquids. The only exception is water. Water has a negative slope for the solid liquid line, and that tells us that ice is actually less dense than liquid water. So A, C, and D are all true about phase diagrams. B is the only false statement, which is why it is the correct answer for this problem. The second question says, looking at the phase diagram for water, what is the condition for the supercritical phase? The supercritical fluid exists only when both the temperature and the pressure are above the critical point. If we go back and look at our phase diagram for water, the critical temperature is 374 degrees Celsius, and the critical pressure is approximately 218 atmospheres. That means the correct answer is C. Next, let's talk about heating curves. A heating curve shows how the temperature of a substance changes as heat is added. On the x-axis, we plot the amount of heat supplied, and on the y-axis, we plot the temperature. As energy is added, the substance moves through different states of matter, progressing from solid to liquid to gas. The curve itself has two types of segments. It has these sloped regions where the temperature increases, and then it has these flat regions where the temperature stays constant. In the sloped regions, the added heat increases the kinetic energy of the particles, so the temperature rises. In the flat regions, however, the added heat does not change the temperature. Instead, it's used to overcome intermolecular forces and drive a phase transition. Each of these phase changes has an associated enthalpy value. So for melting or solid to liquid conversion, the heat required is called the enthalpy of fusion. For boiling or liquid to gas conversion, the heat required is the enthalpy of vaporization. These are constants that tell us how much energy per gram is needed to complete the transition at constant temperature and pressure. 
If we were removing heat instead of adding it, we would trace the curve in reverse. And in that case, condensation is the reverse of vaporization and freezing is the reverse of melting. Now let's walk through the segments of a typical heating curve in detail. In segment one, the substance is entirely in the solid state. Let's take ice as an example. As we add heat, the molecules are gonna vibrate more strongly. That's gonna increase their kinetic energy and raise the temperature. The equation that's used here to calculate heat is Q equals M C solid delta T, where M is mass, C solid is the specific heat capacity of the solid, and delta T is the temperature change. For ice, the specific heat is about 2.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. Then when we reach the melting point of the solid, the temperature actually stops rising. We enter segment two. For water, that occurs at zero degrees Celsius. All of the heat that's added here no longer increases temperature. Instead, it goes into breaking the intermolecular forces that maintain the solid lattice. This is a phase change. So to calculate heat, we use Q equals M multiplied by delta H fusion. For ice, delta H fusion is about 340 joules per gram. Then after all of the solid has melted, the system is now entirely a liquid. We are in segment three. Continuing with our example here, when we add heat to liquid water, it's gonna raise the temperature again. And if we wanted to calculate heat for segment three, we would use the equation Q equals M C liquid delta T. M is mass, delta T is the change in temperature. C liquid is the specific heat capacity for the liquid. For water, this is about 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. When the liquid reaches its boiling point, the next phase change begins. So now we enter segment four. For water, at one atmosphere, this is 100 degrees Celsius. And during this flat region, the temperature remains constant while the heat is used to separate molecules completely into the gas phase. The equation we use to calculate heat in segment four is Q equals M multiplied by delta H vaporization. Now for water, this value is much larger than delta H fusion. Delta H vaporization is about 2,260 joules per gram. And that is because breaking all of the cohesive interactions requires far more energy than simply loosening the solid structure. Now, once all of the liquid has vaporized, we are now in segment five. The system is entirely in the gas phase. Any additional heat again increases temperature and we can calculate the heat for segment five using the equation Q equals M C gas delta T. For water vapor, C gas is about two joules per gram per degree Celsius. So to summarize, Phase changes occur at constant temperature and they involve enthalpy terms, delta H fusion or delta H vaporization. While temperature changes within a single phase, they're described by the specific heat equation Q equals MC delta T. Each segment of the heating curve has to be treated separately. If a problem asks for the total heat absorbed or released across multiple regions, you need to calculate Q for each segment and then add them together. And the key is to recognize where you are on the curve so that you can apply the correct equation. On that note, let's solve this problem. This problem says how much heat is required to heat 0.1 grams of ice at negative 30 degrees Celsius to steam at 100 degrees Celsius. Use the following constants. We're given a set of constants. We notice that some of these values are approximations from what we covered. This is usually intended to make the math easy in case you wanted to practice calculating this without a calculator. Now we're gonna start by recognizing that the process includes four segments of the heating curve. First, we need to warm the solid ice from negative 30 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius. Second, we're gonna melt the ice at zero degrees Celsius into liquid water. 
Third, we warm that liquid water from zero degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. And then finally, we vaporize the liquid at 100 degrees Celsius into steam. Each of these steps uses a different equation and thermodynamic value. So we're gonna calculate them separately and then add them up to get the total heat required. All right, so let's begin with step one. We need to warm the ice from negative 30 up to zero degrees Celsius. The equation is heat equals mass times specific heat times the temperature change. That's 0 0.1 grams times two joules per gram per degree times a 30 degree temperature change. This gives us six joules. Now we move into step two. Now the ice melts at zero degrees Celsius. The equation here is heat equals mass times the enthalpy of fusion. That's 0 0.1 grams times 340 joules per gram, which gives 34 joules. Then we move into step three. We warm the liquid water from zero to 100 degrees Celsius. Again, heat equals mass times specific heat times the temperature change. That's 0 0.1 grams times four joules per gram per degree times a 100 degree change, and that equals 40 joules. Finally, for step four, we vaporize the liquid at 100 degrees. The equation is heat equals mass times the enthalpy of vaporization. That's 0 0.1 grams times 2,260 joules per gram, which comes out to 226 joules. Now we have to add everything together. Six joules plus 34 joules plus 40 joules plus 226 joules. That gives us a total of 306 joules. So the answer is that it takes about 306 joules to heat that sample of ice at negative 30 degrees all the way to steam at 100 degrees. And with that, we've completed this lecture. I hope it helps. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day.